Hi, everyone. You've tuned in to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. I'm John Zimmerman, founder of the Active Towns Initiative and your host on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. This is a truly special episode because it represents the first I've produced as an immersive video, in addition to our standard audio podcast format. And it marks the very first time I've had a repeat guest. Fittingly, it's Ryan Van Duzer of YouTube's Duzer TV. I couldn't think of a better person to interview to launch me into this new medium. And in fact, he even suggested the StreamYard platform, which is what we're using to capture this recording for the respective audio and video versions of this episode. Okay, so you might be wondering why two different versions of the same podcast? The simple explanation is that some people prefer the video format, but the more complete answer is that some topics and guests are just naturally more stimulating and interesting in full color, high resolution video. Using this interview with Ryan as an example, in post-production, I blend in plenty of video clips and still photography relevant to what we're talking about. So you, as a viewer, will get a deeper, richer, more intimate experience. In fact, some of you might listen to the audio version on your usual podcast platform, get curious about the visuals being presented, and when appropriate, tune in to watch the video. And I'll say up front, Although I've been producing videos for the Active Towns Culture of Activity Vimeo channel for many years, this is my first foray into the world of YouTube. So be patient. I'm learning the ropes in this new environment. All right, back to the episode with Ryan. I primarily wanted to talk with him about bikepacking and a couple of the epic trips he squeezed in this summer once it was safe enough for him to venture out from his boulder lair. Ultimately, we cover a lot of additional ground, including living car-free, how a new e-bike got his mom riding again, and we even mix in a little ultra-running banter as he recounts this year's Caballo Blanco race down in Mexico's Copper Canyon. But before we dive into all things Doozer, please allow me this moment to mention that this episode is being brought to you by the generous support of our donors and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. Thank you all so very much for helping out in any way that you can. I really do appreciate whatever contributions you're able to provide. To learn more about how you too can make a huge difference in helping me produce this content, please head over to activetowns.org and hit on that donate button on the top right corner of the page. Also, as always, I've included all the appropriate links in the show notes to both the audio and video versions. Okay. Let's get this adventure with my buddy Ryan Van Duzer rolling. Enjoy. Hey, Ryan, I am so delighted to see you. And we are having some fun here on a new platform. This is StreamYard. Normally, you're using this to yeah. stream live out on Facebook and YouTube, your YouTube channel. Uh, I'm not streaming live yet. This is not streaming live. This is actually being recorded. But uh, huge props to you, man. Thank you so much for recommending this platform. It's going to be fun to try to do yeah. A podcast, which will have both an audio component and then also turn this into a video podcast. Totally. So, thank I, you. I did my hair because I knew I was going to be on video. So yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to look right. Yeah, absolutely. I, well, I, I, I do. I do appreciate uh, you. Uh, you know, kind of sprucing up the back there and uh, sprucing up the hair and all that. I am sporting my uh, my COVID nineteen lockdown hair, which uh, means that. Uh, I've had just one haircut in the past, I want to say six months. All right. And that was Laura graciously uh, deciding to take out our newly acquired clippers and, uh, <laughs> and, and shear me down. <laughs> so now I'm getting to that point where I, I need to, to do that once again. But uh, hey, so wonderful to see you here and connect with you live, uh, even though we're not broadcasting live, but you and I are talking live. This is real uh, live. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So tell us what's what's going on. I mean, obviously you and I spoke uh just 
gosh, I want to say it was in March and it was before things got really, really locked down and really, really crazy with the coronavirus. Uh, we're in two different states. You're in, you're, in, you're in Colorado. I'm in Texas. We're in two different worlds. We're still locked down here because we didn't behave very <laughs> responsibly and, and our numbers went out of control. What's it like in Colorado? What, what, what's sort of uh, you know, the situation right now? Colorado is, is behaving, which is really good. And I credit that to our leadership of the governor, Jared Polis, really leading by example. Everybody is wearing a mask, especially if you're going inside any stores. You know, I just rode the Great Divide route and in Montana and Wyoming, you would never know there was a pandemic going on because very, very few people were wearing masks. Right when I crossed the border into Colorado, it was mask mania, which, which is a good thing. And so Colorado, our numbers are low and we seem to be doing all right. But I hear that you Texans are coming up here and infecting us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. And in fact, that was in the, the paper and on uh, on some uh, various streams and talking about the fact that uh, it's been so hot down here yeah. that uh, many, many Texans are just trying to to break away and, and, and get to some cooler weather. And I can certainly relate because... I'm usually hanging out in Boulder about this time of year. Um, yeah. Last year, I was there for uh, almost a good solid two months. And so I'm going through withdrawals, Colorado yeah. withdrawals. <laughs> so let's dive in and talk about the main topic of discussion of the day. And that is something that, that you really have dove into, or I should say have peddled your way into big time this year. You've done a little bit of it before. I know last year you did a, a bit of this as well. And that's bike camping, mm -hmm. getting that mountain bike set up and putting your camping gear on and doing the adventures that you, you know, had previously been doing on road bikes. Heck, you've even done it on a cruiser bike <laughs> going long distances. And uh, and then I guess, was it last year you did it on a gravel type bike? Yes. Yeah, I've done it all, on all sorts of bikes. All sorts of bikes. So, but you've really been diving into somewhat shorter trips, but intensive because they are full on camping gear on a mountain bike. Talk a little bit about that because it's pretty special. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been bike touring since 2005. My first big adventure was riding from Honduras to Boulder after I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And, you know, I camped out almost every single night and I love it. It makes me feel alive. You know, when you ride your bike 75 to 100 miles a day and you find a nice camping spot and you lay out your tent and your pad and your body's exhausted and you're looking at the stars, it's just a wonderful feeling. And as a bonus, if you can camp next to some water and jump in a creek or a lake and clean off a little bit, it's one of the best feelings in the world. So yeah, I've been, I, that's one of my favorite parts of traveling by bike is actually the camping part. And uh, yeah, I've been going on, you know, long trips and little trips. And this year during, uh, you know, the, the full on lockdown in March, I did some backyard camping trips to my friends' houses just so I could sleep outside, you know, when it got warm enough. I rode my bike all the way from my house to my mom's house, which is maybe three and a half miles away. But I got my bike all set up like I would have for a, a big ride, went to my mom's backyard and uh, just camped in her backyard <laughs> like like the good old days. And it was a lot of fun. So did you produce a, a video for that particular excursion going to your mom's backyard? Yeah, pretty much anything I do in life these days is documented. So yeah, I made a video called Backyard Bike Packing and it got a lot of views because I think people were, you know, starving for ideas on, on what to do with themselves. And I, I got a lot of feedback saying, oh, I watched your video and then I slept in the backyard with my kids and my family and we made s'mores and it was so fun. And it's it's one of those little things you can do to just spice up your life and just sleep outside. And you, you don't have to go on an epic bike packing trip to do it. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's, uh, and it, it, and it's so refreshing too, to be able to just, you know, especially during that time when we were all sort of locked down and you just were like itching to get out. And yeah. we're seeing that, you know, here in, in the Austin area. 
And it manifests here in a slightly different way. You know, people are just getting out, going for a walk, going for a bike ride and, and trying to get some fresh air. Um, I was able to get a, a nice trail run in yesterday and, you know, being able to immerse yourself in nature is just so incredibly important for our well-being. So talk a little bit about um, the trip that you did over in Tahoe, because that was a pretty special trip. Yeah. So this June, late June, I went on my first trip since the lockdown and I flew out to Lake Tahoe to go bikepacking with one of my good friends. And we did what's called the Tahoe Twirl. It's a route that was developed by bikepacking.com. Bikepacking.com, by the way, is a great place for ideas. If you're looking to get into this, they have routes all over the world. And uh, we went on this four day trip around Lake Tahoe, which is stunningly beautiful. And uh, it's, it's full on mountain biking. It's not gravel biking. It's not just like mild dirt roads. It is full on single track, very difficult mountain biking. And uh, we earned it. We, you know, we would go 35 miles a day, which is not very far, but when you're gaining five, 6,000 feet of elevation, and just riding up and down steps and rocks and stuff. You don't go very fast, but I mean, we found some amazing campsites right next to Alpine Lakes. There was no moon at the time, so the stars were incredible, and we absolutely loved it. That's so cool. Yeah, I was I was loving watching the different episodes as the uh, videos as you were putting them out, and it was just so cool to follow that trip along. Talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the people that you met along the way uh, and, you know, because it was, it, it was, it was interesting and, and challenging in a couple of different realms. Yes, the pandemic, but also that was June. That was the, the, the month of major Black Lives Matters protests and things of that nature. Yeah. So meeting people is one of my favorite parts about going on bike tours when you're out there on a bike in the middle of nowhere people get curious as to what you're doing and i've had so many wonderful interactions with people all over the world and uh, when you're on a bike you're you're not a, a threatening you know uh image to somebody you're just a dude on a bike and uh it's it's a great way to start start a little encounter with a with a fellow human and our first day on the ride, uh, the route took us through Reno. And uh, in downtown Reno, there is an area where they have, at, at least at the time, they had essentially a permanent Black Lives Matter installation. And they had some people there that were curating all the signs and posters that were people were bringing up. And uh, I interviewed a couple of them in the video. And these were just, you know, people that wanted to protect you know the the signs that people were putting up as we know it's a very polarizing issue we've seen you know footage of people all over the country ripping down the blm signs and stuff and so there were people there protecting it 24 hours a day and it was a really powerful um i don't know if what you, you wouldn't call it a memorial maybe a little bit of a memorial but it was a, it was a powerful thing to see uh, the entire city of reno coming together yeah, in solidarity over this movement. Yeah, what an interesting way to 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 start off the the you know the video series for that ride is yeah. that human interest story and the connection to that and and again um, you know in in the 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 face of not only a health issue and a health scare with a you know a worldwide pandemic but then also you know this you know coming up and boiling up and boiling over and then being able to to make that human connection so very very cool part of that series of, of videos so let's dive in you say it was a you, you say it was a cool part i loved it i thought it was very very powerful oh it, absolutely I, and, and i, I encourage everybody online, I, there was a lot of uh, polarization. A lot of my viewers didn't like it. And I've been somewhat vocal and outspoken about BLM on my channel. And uh, it's, you know, it just like anywhere in the United States, people uh, get fired up about that stuff. And they tell me to stick to bikes and don't get into politics and all this other stuff. So, you know, it was, it was a little bit disappointing to see some of that reaction. Right. But I also, I expected it. Yeah. Yeah. 
<sighs> yes. <laughs> the deep <laughs> sigh. Why does it have to get political? You know, yeah. it's like uh, it's, to me, it's a human yeah. issue. It's a yeah. human issue. I don't I don't look at it as politics. I look at it as loving um, everybody in our community equally and fighting for injustice. And yeah. that's exactly what BLM is. And with my channel, I really think it's important to tell these stories. My channel is mostly uh, an endurance adventure channel, cycling and running. And that is it's it's hugely white and male, the audience. And I think it's important for me as a white male to tell these stories and, and talk to my viewers about why it's important to me. And I'm not forcing any ideas on anybody. I'm just I'm just reporting the news essentially in that moment. I am a journalist and I'm giving my feedback as well. Right. Yeah. No, I, I totally relate to that as well. And uh, when we look at your experience, when you when you sort of left Reno and you got out into the trail there, what was that like? I mean, was it, did you run across a, a quite a few people also out on the trail getting, escaping into nature uh, because of the desire to, uh, you know, get away from the pandemic and, and the stress of the moment, or was it pretty quiet? Did you not see very many people? Well, I saw a lot of people. So Lake Tahoe was booming. Again, it was kind of like nobody really paid attention to the pandemic. I think people were just sick of lockdown and they were going to travel no matter what. So the day before we started the ride, we went to Tahoe City and I rented a bicycle and it, you know, the sidewalks were packed and there were people everywhere. On the California side, people were, were wearing masks because there was a pretty strict mask mandate. When we got into Reno, which is Nevada, almost nobody was wearing a mask. So that was pretty interesting. As far as other people on the trail, we definitely saw locals that were out for day rides. But as far as other people doing the entire loop, we only saw a couple of people doing that. And uh, like you said, yeah, people want to get outside. Nature is a very healing place to be. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that after I left uh, throughout J July and August, there's been a lot more people in the Tahoe area. I just did the Great Divide and there were people everywhere. Well, you just skipped ahead to, uh, you know, the next topic, which was the Great Divide. Why don't you explain for our listeners what the Great Divide is? The Great Divide was developed in the mid nineties. It was one of the first big, long off-road bike packing routes. It, the technical name is the Great Divide mountain bike route. And it goes from Banff, Canada, all the way up there down to the border of Mexico in New Mexico. And this is a dream of mine I had for a long time to do this route. And I finally put it together this summer. As Americans, we can't go into Canada. So I started at the very northern part of Montana and just rode all the way down. And it's the longest, they say, the longest off-road bike route in the world at 2,700 miles. I was unable to get into New Mexico because New Mexico also has a very strict 14 day quarantine rule for any travelers coming into the state. So I only did about 1800 miles of the route from Montana to the border of New Mexico. And it was beautiful. I mean, it's remote and stunning. You ride through all sorts of different landscapes, forests and deserts and you meet all sorts of wonderful people, trail angels. It was outstanding. And I know that you're uh, getting into the process of editing, uh, you know, the stories that uh, that you recorded along the way. But you actually took the time to put some live feeds out or some maybe not all, all completely live, but you, you were able to keep us updated yeah. uh, for those of us who follow you on the various social media channels. Uh, originally, you, you thought you were probably going to be alone for yeah. this trip. Yeah. Some things happened. You, you you had some friends show up. Exactly. So I was doing it alone for sure. 24 hours before I left, my friend texted me and said, hey, man, do you want some company? And I was like, yeah, sure. But where are you? And this was a friend that I had met in Baja in January, a guy named John. And he had been bikepacking with his dog from Banff, Canada, all the way down to Baja when I met him in January. And then he texted me 24 hours before I left on this ride. 
and said he was in Oregon and that he would rent a U-Haul and drive over to Montana and meet me. And that's exactly what he, he did. And so I got to ride with my good friend, John, and his awesome dog, Mira. We rode together for, I think, a little over two weeks. And then we had another friend meet outside of Jackson, Wyoming. So for a lot of the ride, we were three dudes and a dog. That is so cool. <laughs> I, I love Vera too. You know, it was neat catching up with her and, and you know, and, and the little cameos that she made. She, you know, made that little cameo there in, in the Tahoe uh, just before you guys, you know, started riding and, and all of that. So, yeah, that was special to 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 see that and and feel that. Now you also mentioned the Baja trip. Let's talk a little bit about that trip because that was a redo of a trip that you had attempted before. Yeah, so the Baja Divide is something that I first did in January. Uh, yeah, no, November two thousand seventeen, and it is beautiful but very very hard. And I went down there not quite knowing what I was getting myself into. There's lots of sand and washboarded roads. The route is really, really hard, way harder than the Great Divide. And my first attempt kind of beat me up. And so after two weeks, I called it quits and went home. And then this January, I decided to go back and finish it up. So I started where I left off, kind of halfway through Baja and did another two weeks. And it was absolutely stunning. I love Baja. I love Mexico. I love beans and tacos. And so it was pretty much a dream come true. And uh, that series of videos that you produce for that, again, just absolutely so enjoyable. So really encourage uh, folks that if you're not already following Ryan and his uh, YouTube channel, you, you've got to check it out. Um, there's so much wonderful, fun content out there to, to dive into. And, and that, again, is, is a wonderful series of videos. And... Uh, and and has some some wonderful storylines, and we we won't give up you know all the cool stuff that happens, but you know even all the way down to the very last video and the very last day, the surprise, know, some, yeah, some a surprise and some really cool stuff that happens. So. I would say watch the videos not for me but for Mira. Mira the dog is a wonder dog, and <laughs> she is so fun all at all times. I've never had a dog in my life because I travel so much. But it was really cool just having a dog with us all day, every day. And the great thing about a dog is they're always this happy and ready to go. And you might have had the hardest day of your life on the bicycle. But when you finish the day and you put your bike down, this dog's like, all right, let's play. Find some sticks. Let's play fetch. and Let's go for it. And it's just it brings you back to, I don't know, what's important in life. And it's just like, OK, all right. Thank you, dog, for reminding me what's important. So for those listeners uh, to the Active Towns podcast, uh, and if you've been listening since the very beginning, you know that I have uh, interviewed Ryan before. In that first episode, we did go into a little bit more of his history. I've also interviewed Ryan on camera. We both were on bikes and we, we did a little live interview while riding bikes on the trails that are there outside of his house there in Boulder. And so, you know, that's, that is a, a, a nice little snapshot there of, of your history and, and your background. But for those uh, listeners who are, are, you know, sort of tuning in and maybe have just discovered this newly launched video version of the podcast or are listening into this and, you know, just discovering Ryan for the very first time. Why don't you give your elevator pitch of who you are and how you came to be this, you know, this person who just continues to serve as an activity ambassador and, you know, the get out there guy that you are. Yeah, I have always loved being outdoors. I was lucky and fortunate to be born in Boulder, Colorado, where we have an amazing backyard of adventurous things to do. And I've, I've embraced it ever since I was a little kid. As far as my career now, uh, I got started essentially in 2005. I started a public access TV show called Get Out There. The whole idea was to inspire people to get off their couches and get outside. And it didn't matter what you were doing, just being outside was the important part. I'm not an elite athlete myself. Everything that I do, I try to do in a way that shows you, the viewers, anybody, that, that you can do it as well. And you don't have to have the most expensive gear or the experience or the training. It's all about just breathing fresh air, being outside, being nice to mother nature, 
and connecting with our fellow humans. And now, essentially today, I put all of my heart and soul into my YouTube channel and I create content from all over the United States and the world about different endurance events and activities and adventures that I get myself into. And again, the whole goal is to inspire viewers to give it a shot and challenge themselves. Yeah, and and it really is inspiring. It's it's so much fun to to catch your your different adventures. And one of the things that I do love about you too is that you have a diversity of interests. You're not or not only is it the mountain biking and the long distance touring in terms of riding, but you also love running too. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that love. I've, I've been a runner longer than I've been a cyclist ever since I was a little kid. And I got started here in Boulder doing the Boulder Boulder 10K race, which is one of the biggest 10Ks in the country. 50,000 people every year do this race. And I did it for the first time when I was six. <laughs> little, I was a little teeny dude. And I really, I just love the feeling of it. And running to me is even simpler than biking. And biking is, is a simple thing to do. All you need is a pair of shoes and you just run out your door. And I love that freedom. And uh, yeah, I've been running races all my life, all through high school. And now I do a lot of uh, ultra events. You know, I read the book Born to Run about 10 years ago, got really inspired by that book to try something longer than the marathon distance. And I actually went down to the Copper Canyons where a lot of that book takes place. And I ran the Caballo Blanco 50 miler and I've done some hundred milers since then. And I love the community of runners. Runners are just great, friendly people usually. And uh, yeah, so running for me, on a day-to-day -day level, I run way more than I bike. Yeah, it's and it's so fun to follow along with those adventures as well. And especially when you do make it down to the Copper Canyon and, and be able to, you know, talk about that as an experience and the people that are down there, because that that race really does have a lot of heart and soul to it. It's what it was all about when uh, Micah True put that, you know, event together. It was about a way to, to, to reach out and serve that community. So it's really, really cool that you were able to make it down there. Now, the yeah, event... There, buddy i know i do need to get down there <laughs> I, I don't know if you and i have had this this conversation before but billy barnett uh you know bonehead billy there yeah. is as, as part of the book you know one of the care quote unquote characters in the books yeah. one of the guys that was profiled in the book you know he ended up moving to the big island so oh, yeah. when i was still living in uh on the big island and in the kona area I was producing uh, a couple of different 5Ks and 10K races and Billy would show up and run the race and he was just so chill and so cool and and he's still doing, you know, ultra races and 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 running. Uh you know, he he lives over on the Hilo side of of the Big Island, but uh super cool to to connect with somebody who you had read about in in yeah. the book. So, it was really neat. If you go out into the Copper Canyons, you're guaranteed to meet Barefoot Ted. He's always down there, and he is just as big of a character in real life as he is in the book. And the community of people that go down there are, are really special. There's people from all over the world. And then, of course, the locals uh, are, are wonderful. And then the Tarumadas who run in the sandals and their traditional clothing. It's, it's really, to me, it's not just a race. It's a whole week-long cultural exchange. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I definitely do want to make it down there someday. Did did the event happen this year or was it canceled? Yeah, it did. That was, that's the only race I did this year was the Caballo Blanco. And it was right before everything went haywire around the world. It was in early March. And I remember flying home from Chihuahua and seeing local newscasts in the airport saying, you know, pilots have COVID in Dallas or whatever, and they're shutting things down. I was like, oh, wow, this is getting serious. After this quick break, Ryan provides a little more detail on bikepacking on a mountain bike, living a car-free lifestyle, and talks about his immersive filmmaking style and how that relates to nature. But first, allow me this brief moment to mention, if you're enjoying the Active Towns podcast, please be sure to subscribe either here on YouTube or if you're listening uh, to the audio version, 
on the podcast platform of your choice, including Apple, Spotify, Overcast, and Google. Okay, that's all for this break. Let's get back up to speed with Ryan Van Duzer. Well, I want to talk a little bit more and deeply about the the bike camping concept and the bike touring concept that, you know, because normally in the summertime, uh, you have several different trips, you know, sort of coordinated the last few years. It's been, you know, there was a coordination and an orchestration that was in place uh, to do RAGBRAI. That, of course, could not happen this year. Talk a little bit about that difference between, you know, that sort of on-road, mostly on-road experience versus doing what you've been doing this year, which has been almost exclusively single track. Yeah. So most of my touring up until the last couple of years has been on-road touring, and it's a different setup. You can ride a road bike, and you can have big, fat panniers on the back of your bike that just hold everything and it's, it's it's pretty easy to pack in that situation when you're doing a single track bike packing trip off road you know you have a seat pack that comes off the back of your bike and a frame pack and you don't have as much room as the big panniers so you've got you have to bring a lot less and be very good at cramming things into small places and uh it's fun though i i the, the main reason why i like bike packing and probably most people would say this is you're a lot safer. You're not, you're not cars aren't whizzing by your head all day long when you're riding on a road, when you're in the middle of nowhere on a rail trail or a, a single track trail in Tahoe, it's just you out there. And it, the, the peace uh, and serenity and just the opportunity to be away from vehicles, it just makes you breathe easier. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Now, you are somebody who uses your bike, uh, not necessarily the same bike that you use on these trips, but you have a bike that you use for like everyday life because you never owned a car. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had a car. When I was young, I made a pledge to myself to never have a car. And those reasons were that I was going to try to be as environmentally conscious as possible when I was a little kid cars to me were polluters and that was bad you know of course there's electric cars now and there's there's much more fuel efficient vehicles but yeah i've never had a car so my bike is my car i do all my grocery shopping on my bike i when I mean, a friend calls me to hang out i ride my bike if, if a girl wants to go on a date we're riding bikes <laughs> i love it i love it so uh you have a special relationship with uh, a, a variety of different bike manufacturers but recently you've been honing in uh, with one particular bike manufacturer uh, in fact you tested a brand new bike that was built specifically for you for these bike packing trips yeah. let's talk a little bit about that bike because it's got some pretty neat technology for sure so uh, Priority Bicycles is a wonderful company out of New York City, and they're all about making low maintenance bicycles because, as we all know, most <laughs> Americans who get a bike, they get a flat tire and they don't know how to fix it. And the bike sits in the garage for six months, you know, and they don't touch it where it's, it's a very easy thing to fix or they don't need to know how to lube the chain or something very simple. So they want to make bikes that always work. And a big part of that is in the drivetrain. So every single one of Priority Bicycles has a carbon belt drive. And you gotta think of like a belt drive you see in a motor or something. They're not, it's not made out of metal, it's not a chain. And those never need to be lubed ever. So no maintenance there. And then also they use components where all the gears are, are inside. So either it's a pinion gearbox where it's all enclosed near the crank or it's some sort of a a hub system where all the gears are inside of a hub with the Shimano Alphine system or a new Vinci hub, which I think is based out of Austin and um, the Shimano Nexus systems. So the whole idea is you can ride it through rain and snow and mud and you're not gunking up a chain and a rear derailleur. It's all enclosed. Uh, and that is what's really cool about Priority Bikes. And yes, for this ride, we developed this bicycle together. I'd always dreamed of a bike packing bike with the gates and pinion setup, and we made it happen. And I rode this prototype bike on this trip and it was flawless. 
Cool, cool. And I know we'll probably get more information on that ride uh, as you continue to produce these, uh, you know, the videos for the Divide trip. And uh, yeah, what a difference, right? You know, the difference between having that bike that was delivered to you just in time to be able to do the Divide versus just renting a bike, you know, yeah. for the California trip. Yep. So, yeah. Well, the, the, the truth is that bike was supposed to get to me for the Tahoe ride, but it just, you know, manufacturing ch in China has been difficult and it was delayed. And so I thought I was going to ride that new bike, but it just didn't get there in time. So I flew out of Denver knowing that I was going to have to go to a bike shop and just rent whatever I could find. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and truth be told, you, you have that experience. You have ridden, you know, as we mentioned earlier, you've, you've done bike rides, long bike rides on less than perfect, less than ideal yeah. technology. It's yeah. okay. It's, it's about the joy of the ride. So. Yeah. And, you know, I always tell my viewers, don't get caught up in all the gear and the most expensive stuff. You can ride 3,000 miles on a $150 bike you get off of Craigslist. You really can. Most bikes are, are pretty solid. So that's one of my big messages is don't let technology get in the way. Um, I've been very fortunate over the years to work with companies that give me pretty high quality bicycles. But my first rides, I was riding whatever I could ride and whatever I could afford. Yeah. And speaking of technology, uh, one of the things that is really special about the content that you create, especially when you're out there doing these uh, experiential trips and these adventures, is you do a really, really good job of capturing nature and capturing, you know, you do some, some nice photography and some nice videography of nature and being able to, you know, sort of bring the viewer into what it's like, what you're seeing through your eyes. But then you also do something rather special as you give us a bird's eye view. Talk a little bit about that part of the filmmaking, which you've sort of, you know, incorporated very much into your videography uh, of late in the last few years. Yeah, and that's the whole idea. I want my videos to be immersive. When I'm high, really high and excited, I want you to feel that excitement. When it's hard, and I'm tired and I'm going through a rainstorm. I want you to, to feel the discomfort. And that's what I try to do with a different array of cameras. And yeah, there's some moments where it sucks to pull out the camera. Like it's the last thing you want to do. But, it, but if you don't capture that moment, you can't convey that to the viewer. You can't like later that day be like talking to the camera. Man, I went through such a crazy rainstorm today. You wouldn't believe it. You know, that this doesn't work. So uh, I think what you're talking about is drone footage and that has really upped my cinematic game and it really gives the viewer a much better look of the landscapes that I'm riding through. And a lot of times it gives me a better view of the landscapes that I'm riding through because you're, you know, let's say you're in Montana and you're stuck in the trees, you fly your drone up 500 feet and you're like, wow, that's what it looks like out here. This is crazy. So yeah, drone footage has absolutely opened up the the world of uh uh of uh you know videography in so many different ways yeah and it's because i follow you so closely and and we've been good friends over the last few years and and i really appreciate all your mentorship and and help that you've uh extended my way but i know that <laughs> those drones can be really really challenging yeah. how many drones have you gone through uh, I think I've broken six drones in the last couple of years. And, uh, yeah, it's a bummer. I mean, we, cause I fly them while I'm riding my bike. This is a question I get all the time is how do you do this? There are some follow features on a drone where it just slowly tracks you, but it has to be pretty close to you. And I like really, really wide shots. So you get a view of the whole landscape. And that tracking feature doesn't work when it's really far away from you. So a lot of times I'm pedaling and controlling the drone. So it looks like I'm playing a video game almost. And I'm looking up and looking down as I'm pedaling. And uh, I always try to do this, obviously, on roads where there's no cars and other things. Uh, but yes, when that happens, you're bound to, you know, 
smash it into a few trees here and there. And that's definitely happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess I bring that up only to uh, make this a little bit real for folks is that it's not like Ryan just, you know, discovered drone photography and, and went, went into it and it was like, Oh yeah, that, that's a piece of cake. It's, it, it is challenging. It's hard. So. Yeah. And then, you know, keeping the batteries charged, drone batteries only last about 12 minutes. And when you're on a bike tour, you don't have access to power all the time. And so I carry a lot of extra batteries, which is a lot of extra weight, which means less camping equipment or other things. So it's really a trade off. And it is very hard to document these rides. You know, it's hard enough to go on a bike tour and ride your bike 80 to 90 to 100 miles a day let alone on top of that, stop all of the time and set up the camera and the tripod and the drone and talk to the camera. And it's like, da, da, da. It's, it's a lot of work. And uh, I just actually, the video that's gonna come out soon is about the process and what I go through to create these videos. Cause people are always like, Ryan, make more videos, make more videos, just pop them out. They just think that it's easy, but it is far from easy. Yeah, exactly. And and I've been humbled just as to even like with just podcast editing and turning these things around. Uh, it's it's a lot of work. It's way more work than I had anticipated being and it. But it's it's super, super fun. And I'm super stoked about this particular uh, interview and this opportunity to create a video version uh, of the podcast and, and start getting this out onto some new Active Towns channels. We've never had a presence out on YouTube. This is gonna be the beginning of that. Uh, yes, yes, part of the YouTube family. And, uh, but it'll also go, at, at, it'll have a permanent archive out on the uh, Vimeo channel, which I do have many, many videos uh, produced from over the years. and including, as we mentioned, uh, the one where we did the interview of you. And and we've had a couple of times where we've been able to, you know, create content together as well as separately in the same place at the same time, which is always a pleasure. Yeah. So what's what else is new for you? So here we are. It's it's towards the end of August now. What's the next adventure? I always get the, this question at the end of every podcast. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what's next. That's just kind of how my life is, especially right now with the pandemic. I can't travel as freely as I used to. I'm going to try to fit in another um, seven day San Juan Huts bike packing trip. And those those trips are really cool. It's only here in Colorado. But uh, you essentially ride hut to hut and you don't need to bring as much because the huts are stocked with all the food you could ever want and water and sleeping bags. And so you can ride pretty light. And if the, the lighter you can ride your bike, the happier you're gonna be. That goes for bike packing or huts, whatever. And so I'm gonna try to do one of those, but I'm always dreaming up new adventures. I'd love to get to Europe next year. I was gonna ride the length of Great Britain this summer, but obviously we can't get there. Maybe next summer I'll go back and try to finish off the divide route in New Mexico. There's so many other beautiful places to, to ride my bike and run. I'm going to do some more runs and uh, we'll just, we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you brought up a, a point a, a little bit earlier too, about, you know, the, that concept of, you know, you use your bike as your vehicle. Um, uh, something happened relatively recent too, is that your mom started riding more. Yeah. Talk about that. Totally. So she didn't ever really ride a bike very often. Maybe once a year on bike to work day here in Boulder, she would ride the three miles to work. And that was her yearly ride. And it's, it's just because, you know, a lot of people don't want to get sweaty before work or they just, you know, the, the physical output is too much or they don't have the right clothing. There's all, so many excuses to why people don't ride their bikes. Um, and safety is another big one, but I got my mom an e-bike about two years ago and that's really changed things because now she can jump on that thing and cruise anywhere, even, and she can ride with me, something she could never do before. You know, I was just too fast for her and, uh, now she can ride right alongside me. And a lot of times she can whip my butt going up the hills. Last summer, actually, I convinced her to do Ragbri with me, which is a 450 mile ride, which she would never have been able to do on a traditional bike, but on that e-bike, she was cruising every day. And I'm, I'm a big fan of e-bikes 
And I, I think uh, they're great. I think it's the future. I think more and more people are going to be riding e-bikes as cargo bikes to go, you know, doing errands and grocery shopping and toting kids around. And uh, I'm excited to see where all that technology goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you have a wonderful video that you put together that, you know, sort of highlights and illustrates how that really just opened up her world. Yeah. It gave her the ability to go out on rides with some of her friends who yeah. were maybe stronger riders, as well as ride with her son, <laughs> go yeah. out and ride with Ryan. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's super special. And I'm absolutely a huge fan of the electric assist bikes. You know, uh, what a wonderful way to keep more people riding more often. Yeah. And that's a big part of, of, you know, the challenge that we have is making that experience super comfortable and not frustrating and you know sort of leveling the playing field um so one of the things that that one of the reasons why you and i oftentimes are in the same place at the same time is because of bicycle advocacy work and specifically you know making environments uh, more conducive getting more people riding more often talk a little bit about you know that advocacy work that you've done over the years and 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 sort of reflect back think back on the years and think about where we're at now especially in an era right now in the pandemic when when people are riding at unprecedented levels yeah so i would say i got into bicycle advocacy in high school i organized boulder high's first bike to school day 1997 i think and i got some bagels donated from a local shop and uh that was kind of the start of it and i wanted to to promote cycling because you know in america we live in a society where you know bikes are toys and bikes are for kids and when you're 16 you ditch that bike and you drive a car that's essentially the the narrative here and that was what i saw in boulder is that like all my friends when they turn 16 they never touch their bikes again so i wanted to make biking cool and I'm not sure if I accomplished that in high school, but it was definitely the start of things. And then I, you know, I, in 2006, I was the first bicycle ambassador for the city of Boulder alongside my friend, Rich. And we just essentially promoted cycling. Again, we would go to kids summer camps and teach them about helmet use and how to do this hand signals and left and right turns and all that good stuff and, and taught them safe ways to get to school and bike paths and all that stuff. You know, I've done some work with the League of American Cyclists when I rode the cruiser bike across the country. That was a conjunction with them. And then I started working for People for Bikes that's based out of here in Boulder, Colorado, doing different promotions and video work for them. But essentially, you know, my advocacy work is in just leading by example. And that's mainly through my YouTube channel. I want to show people, just like in high school, how cool it is to ride your bike everywhere. Because most people think, oh, wow, how could you ever live without a car? That sounds impossible. But it's not, especially if you live in a town like Boulder that is made for bikes. And obviously, I know a lot of American cities aren't as safe for cycling, but that's where People for Bikes comes in and in their work for bike advocacy and building more protected bike lanes and just safer places for people to ride. Whew, that was a lot. Yeah, no, uh, it's, and, and it's not as straightforward and simple as we make it out to be. It's it. And that's one of the things that we have to realize is that, yeah, it, it can be complicated. Uh, and in fact, it can get politicized just like we were talking about earlier you know, it, it's it's unfortunate that sometimes, uh, you know, efforts like this, you know, get politicized to the point where it's just like, no, don't do that. It's it should be it's such a joy to be able to 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 lead a healthy, active lifestyle and have riding a bike be a part of that, yeah. that, you know, one would hope that we wouldn't, you know, kind of go into that deep, dark hole of, of, of politics. Uh, is there anything that we haven't yet covered that you really think that we should talk about here today? I don't know. Have we talked about 
the different brands of refried beans and how important those are to bike touring. <laughs> so, I, fill, I, so I, fill in the audience as to your love of refried beans and you yeah. know that whole spirit because it's uh, actually it's a reoccurring theme in your videos yes uh for sure uh people know that i am fueled by beans for sure this has been something i've always loved beans and tortillas and mexican food and when you're on a bike tour i think the easiest thing to pack and travel with are beans and you can you can eat them cold or hot and tortillas fold up and they travel really well. If you try to travel with bread, it gets all smashed up and it's worthless. So I've just always been a big fan of the bean diet while on a bike tour. I'm also a vegetarian, so that also plays a role into eating beans all the time. But it's it's good nutritious fruit, food, got some carbs, got some protein, and it just tastes good. You dribble, dribble some Cholula on there, avocado, yeah. Sorry to ruin this podcast. <laughs> no, nah, no, it's a, it's the 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 perfect you know fuel for you know that that bike packing trip that you're oh, doing. So yeah. that's that's fantastic. I think we should probably wrap this this very first video podcast for the Active Towns uh, initiative with uh, a little bit of you know parting advice for you. You know, given where we're at right here today, what advice do you have for the viewers and the listeners? I know a lot of people around the country and the world are rediscovering their love for bicycles right now because of this bicycle boom. We want a safe way to get outside, to socially distance, and biking has been that. And so I just hope people stick with it and, and realize the benefits on a personal level, a health level, an environmental level. Um, it's just, and it's just fun. You think back to some of your best childhood memories. And I bet a lot of you can tap into that feeling of the first time riding your bicycle and the freedom you felt and the wind in your hair and just how joyous it was. And so we all need to just tap back into our childhood love and, and curiosity for the world and ride these two wheels and uh, just enjoy it. Love it, love it. Well, Ryan, thank you so very much for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. Now also the video version of it. Such oh, a pleasure right. having you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's always fun, man. I appreciate it. Thank you all so very much for tuning into this episode with Ryan Van Duzer. I hope you liked it. And if you do, please subscribe. I've got more episodes coming your way. My intent is to have the video podcast episodes have this type of visual stimulation. So not every one of my Active Towns podcast episodes will feature a video version. Okay, a couple quick reminders before we part ways. Please don't hesitate to drop me a line if you have any feedback, suggestions, or questions. My email is john, that's J-O-H-N, at activetowns, that's plural, dot O-R-G. It's always wonderful to hear from y'all. And if you're enjoying the Active Towns podcast, please help me spread the word by telling a friend or two. One last shout out to the amazing Ryan Van Duzer. Be sure to check out his Duzer TV YouTube channel. Thank you so much, buddy. I really appreciate all the support and mentorship. Well, that's all for this episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.